All right, welcome back everyone. It's Doha here. And in this video, we're going to be talking about Borderlands the pre-sequel. And here recently, I've been see and you know, over the past like year, I have been seeing a lot of posts on like Reddit and stuff just bashing Borderlands the pre-sequel. I saw one about probably about 2 days ago that gave it a rating of like a 3 out of 10. They were, they were like rating all the Borderlands games. It just seems like a lot of people don't like Borderlands the pre-sequel. And you know, and everybody has their own personal opinions about games they like and don't like. But it's just I honestly I like this game a lot. The Borderlands the pre-sequel was a pretty good game. Now, do I think it's as good as Borderlands 2? No. Do I think it's as good as Borderlands 1? No. But it is still a great game. Like if I had to rank them in order, uh, on like a scale of one one to ten, I would give probably the pre sequel an eight out of ten. I would give Borderlands one and two. I would give Borderlands two a ten out of ten. I'd give Borderlands one a nine out of ten. I'd give this one an eight out of ten. It definitely deserves it. It's using the same engine as Borderlands two, of course, the same uh, setup with the HUD and everything like that. But it, it had its own ways of being unique, and it did some things better than Borderlands 2. And we're going to talk about it in this video. I have a list of some pros of this game and a couple of the things I don't like. We're going to go over all of those, and I'm going to give, tell you guys exactly why I don't think this game deserves all the hate it gets, and why it is actually a really good Borderlands game, in my opinion. So let's start off with the pros here. And one of the biggest things for me is character interactions. So in this game, in Borderlands the pre-sequel, a lot of the story missions and a good bit of the side quests, your character will actually comment and make jokes and just comment on stuff a lot during those missions. Which is something that almost pretty much never happened in Borderlands 2. And this is one of those things that the pre-sequel did uh, a lot better than Borderlands 2 was with their character interactions. It's something that is one of my favorite things about Borderlands 3 is the fact that your characters just comment on everything, you know, and it feels like it feels like your character is more involved in the story now that they're commenting on everything. And it was kind of like that in the pre-sequel. The pre-sequel had a ton of that in their game, and it's something that really never made an appearance in Borderlands 2. So it didn't feel like your character was as involved in like the story because they wouldn't really they didn't really talk that much but in the pre-sequel they talked a ton in Borderlands 3 the same thing they uh, they saw what they did in the pre-sequel and they kind of copied that you know and they added a little bit more and it was really good but whether your vault hunter is commenting on like just saying jokes or just commenting on certain things that happen in the mission it's very cool I love that they added a ton of character interaction in the uh, Borderlands the pre-sequel it was one it was like the first game where really they really added a ton of it and it was great I'm glad they did that uh, next we're gonna talk about the story a little bit here I feel like the story was pretty good do I think it's as good as the Borderlands 2 story no but I definitely think it's better than the Borderlands 3 story, and, I for sh uh, and I'm pretty sure I am positive that it is better than the Borderlands 1 story. Uh, the Borderlands 1 story and Borderlands 3 story were very weak. But this game, I, I feel like the story, I'm not saying it's just wins because those two are worse. Uh, I think it wins because it is better, uh, in my opinion. Now, like I said, it's not better than the Borderlands 2 story, but it is a pretty good story. And I, I do like it a good bit. I like the final boss at the end. The Sentinel is a very cool final boss. It's also your raid boss. And uh, I love seeing exactly what happened between Borderlands 1 and Borderlands 2. We get to see what happened to some of the characters. And I guess to kind of lead in to my other point here, which is uh, this game. I, I love how this game, it's doing what it's meant to be. And it's filling in the gaps and it's showing new sides to some of the characters. We get to see what Jack was like before he before he turned evil and stuff like that. And we get to see exactly how that happened in the story. And we get to see a ton of other stuff too about other characters that uh that we we normally wouldn't get to see or we didn't get to see in like Borderlands 2 or we definitely didn't get to see in Borderlands 1 because there was really like no character exploring really in that game at all. 
Yeah, so that was very cool. I, I really appreciated it. Uh, it. The game did what it was meant to do, and it did it in a good way. It was meant to fill in the gaps between Borderlands 1 and Borderlands 2, and it did a very good job of that, and it did a, had a very good story along with it as well. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, next here on the list is it had one of the best DLCs in the whole Borderlands series. Uh, this DLC, well now, I'd probably rank it third on my list, but I remember I made a list a while back ranking all of the DLCs, uh, main DLCs, like the main campaigns, not like the Headhunters or nothing. And I will update that, uh, I will do a tier list video on all of the DLCs more than likely once the last one comes out for Borderlands 3, the last main campaign DLC, which we are getting close to. We are getting close to that main campaign DLC being the last one. We are almost there. But with the new one that just came out, Bounty of Blood, I'd sli I'd put, uh, and the, obviously the DLC I'm talking about is the Claptastic Voyage, which is uh, widely considered an amazing DLC. And in my opinion, it is one of the best in the whole series, as some people would even consider it the best. And I put it on my list, I put it second on my list behind Tina's DLC. But with the Bounty of Blood DLC, I'm pretty sure that is my new favorite DLC of all time. I just love that DLC. So I'm putting that at number one and I'm sliding those two back one. But it's still one of the top DLCs. It is an amazing DLC. I love everything about that DLC, having to deal with like the H source and like Shadow Trap and going into like Clab Trap and everything. It is very cool. Very cool DLC. And uh, I love everything about it. It was uh, it was amazing, and uh, like I said, it's widely considered to be one of the best DLCs in the series, and it should be. It had a great final boss fight, and it had some great loot in it as well. It was all, overall just a great DLC. All right, next is the movement, and this is something that I feel is a little bit underrated, but it was really good. This game, like when I said earlier that this game basically, you know, it copied Borderlands 2. It uses like the same engine, which I understand. I don't, I don't take that as like a bad thing, uh, because it was just like a game meant to link two games together, and they didn't feel like spending a huge budget on making a whole brand new thing just for this pre-sequel. And I don't, I don't mind it being on the, looking the same as Borderlands 2, as long as you do something unique. And they did with their movement. So they're on a moon, so it's going to be low gravity. You're going to get the ability to like fly around. You're going to get a new thing called the Oz Kits. And you're going to be able to slam down and do damage. Like, for example, in this gameplay you're seeing here, my slam damage deals cryo. I can slam down and I could freeze people if I have that ability on my Oz Kit. Which is very cool. And obviously, you would have characters in the game that uh, what you would have to go around and collect air because obviously if you ran out of air in your Oz kit you would start to die. One other cool little detail that I'm so glad they added and I love I love the small details that they have in like games like this and other games. And one of the small details is that Claptrap actually doesn't use the air in his Oz kit. Why is that? Because he's a robot. He doesn't require air to breathe. He doesn't have lungs. So that's a very cool little touch that I've always liked about it as well. But the movement overall was cool. You have like little boost jumps and you have like the slams and everything like that, which made the made it feel unique to like the pre-sequel, made it feel unique and separated it from Borderlands 2 a little bit. All right, next is the new element. I really enjoyed Cryo. Cryo was a brand new element that was introduced here into in Borderlands the pre-sequel. And I actually, I enjoyed the element a lot. I loved being able to freeze people and everything like that. And obviously it came back in future games. It came back, well, future game as in Borderlands 3. It came back in Borderlands 3 as an element as well, cryo damage. And I'm glad they did bring it back as well. I enjoy it in that game as well. Cryo is a very cool element to use. And I'm so glad they brought it back. And it was a great element in this game as well. This is another thing that set this game apart from Borderlands uh, from Borderlands 2 it did a really they did a really good job at making and tailoring stuff to the like area they were in they're on a moon well let's get make it where we can boost jump because we have zero gravity and make it to where we can slam and have, we have to have these eyes kissed to be able to breathe and on top of that they added the they added cryo damage 
And on top of that, they even added some new cool weaponry, which was the laser rifles, which kind of made a return in Borderlands 3 as well, I'm pretty sure. Alright, so next are the char playable characters or the Vault Hunters. I think all, I'm, now, I don't think all of them are great, but I do think the ones that are great are like really good. Now, I hate Aurelia. I hate playing as Aurelia. I don't like her as a character either. I'm glad she died in Borderlands 3. Thank God. Uh, Wil Wilhelm is okay. I really enjoyed playing Athena. And I really enjoyed playing Jack. And my favorite out of the whole set of Vault Hunters is Nisha. Really enjoyed playing Nisha. She is definitely... I, made, I literally just made a Vault Hunter tier list. And Nisha is in my S tier. I love playing as her. I love her action skill and everything. Great character overall, in my opinion. But Athena's good. And uh, like I said, Jack is a very underrated character. I feel like the Jack Doppelganger, obviously, is a playable character. And he's very underrated, in my opinion. He's very good. I enjoy playing as him, as him a lot. There's a lot of cool builds you can do with him. Now, I do not, like I said, I do not like Aurelia that much. I don't really like... Uh, Wilhelm that much even though he is pretty good don't get me wrong I just don't really enjoy playing him that much Claptrap's okay but he's you know Claptrap but yeah I feel like the characters were pretty good overall and, and just looking at them in an overall way I think they are very good and it definitely a positive for this game okay so next and the last thing I'll talk about in the good tier is the legendary gear and it was good legendary gear. I enjoyed a lot of the legendaries in this game. And uh, obviously some that come to mind are like the Bulwark Shield, which was very good. And the Laser Disker, which is a laser uh, laser rifle that was really good as well. And there were a ton of other weapons that were really legendaries that were good in this game also. And one other big thing I would like to congratulate this game on is that it didn't just copy and paste legendaries from Borderlands 2. Yes, there are there were some returning legendaries that were in Borderlands 2 that came to this game. Flacker, Sham, and there was some more. But this game also had its own unique legendaries and that was the majority of them. They had mostly new brand new legendaries for this game. And I like uh, it helps once again set it apart from Borderlands 2. Despite it looking the same, it helps set to, set it apart. Also, real quick, I'm having to throw some Borderlands 3 gameplay in here because this is that was the only pre sequel gameplay I had on my whole hard drive. And at the moment, I'm actually installing it on my PC, Borderlands the pre sequel. So I can't get any more gameplay at the moment. So I'm sorry about that, but don't worry, we're almost done here. We're almost done with the video, so we don't have to sit through too much of this. But, yeah, the gear was great, and uh, there were some legendary weapons that were brought back from Borderlands 2 that were actually better in this game because of this, uh, whether it be characters or just the weapon getting a buff. One of those weapons I can think of is the Flacker. The Flacker wasn't that great in Borderlands 2. I, th I think it could be pretty good on one character. I think that was Krieg, but in Borderlands... Uh, the pre-sequel, it could be good on multiple characters, and it was also really good on Claptrap. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get to our cons really quickly. I don't actually have many that I uh, that I find too aggravating, but we will get into them here. Uh, the first thing I will talk about is the game did have problems at first, and some of those problems are still there. Uh, the one biggest problem for me is the farming in the game. I think they kind of fixed it a little bit early on. It's kind of fuzzy. I can't really remember too much uh, back uh, back around when the, this was happening. But I remember when the game first launched, like a lot of the bosses that would drop legendaries would not respawn. Like I remember the boss that you had to do to kill, that you had to get the flacker from. It was like this little, uh, I forget what the name of the enemy is called, but he was in like this little trash pile. And you basically had to keep the quest active, and you just had to keep dashboard farming. I think that's how you had to do it, was you had to dashboard farm as you killed him. If you didn't get it, you had to keep doing that until you got the weapon. And I think they did fix a lot of those and actually made a lot of them respawnable, but that was one thing I never got that they did whenever coming from Borderlands 2. Borderlands 2 was a masterpiece, and they had all these great features, 
with the farming and everything with the bosses, respawnable bosses. And it's something they decided for some reason to take out of the pre sequel at first. And I know they tried to fix it later on, but I still think it is a problem. You guys have to let me know. I haven't played the pre sequel here in a little bit, uh, but I know it is a very good game. And I, I just can't exactly remember if they fixed it or not. Uh, next is the fast travel. Yet another thing Borderlands 2 exceeded in, and Borderlands 3 does the same, does a lot better at it too. But something Borderlands 2 just did amazing at was putting fast travel stations everywhere, making it where you could spawn closer to the bosses you were farming. They took a step back with this in Borderlands the pre-sequel, and they stepped back to the more Borderlands 1 type fast travel system and spawning system. Basically, you had to spawn at the beginning of the map each time and run all the way through it to get where you were going and everything. And then there were like no save stations in between that where you could just respawn at. You'd have to spawn at the beginning of the map every time and run all the way there instead of just spawning pretty much like right by where the boss was at and then uh, running and killing it. So that was definitely a step back more to the Borderlands 1 direction. We all know how long it takes to farm the armory in Borderlands 1. You have to go all the way through everything to get there uh next is a little a little bit minor but it is something that i have that i find aggravating and that is the character named pickle this is basically the ava of borderlands the pre-sequel i cannot stand this character i hate this character i hope honestly he never comes back in another borderlands game even though i imagine he will I hope he never does. I cannot stand this character. I won't touch on this one too much, but I honestly can't stand this character. All right, last thing. And this is the last con I have for this game. And uh, it, it is the grinder. And I don't like the grinder that much. I feel like it's something that you are dependent on in this game. Now, I do understand it to an extent. The, if the boss, like early on in the game when the bosses did not respawn and everything. But I I just don't like the grinder at all. The, and I'll give you my reason why. I, each Borderlands game. Now, Borderlands 1 has the least effect to this for the most part. But almost each Borderlands game has like this certain feature that like you have to have to really... Uh, do your best in the game uh, Borderlands 2 was slag if your build it and once you got them uh, OP like 10 or 8 well it was 8 previously before they updated the 10 about a year ago but when you got the OP 8 and you got the playing against all like those uh, more leveled characters you had to have slag on your character you had to have a way to slag people or you were not going to do any damage and in Borderlands 3, in my opinion, it is the anointments. Uh, your weapons can be good without anointments in Borderlands 3, but for them to excel at Mayhem 10 and to be as good as you can be on a build, you need to have anointments on your weapon. In Borderlands the pre-sequel, I feel like that thing is the grinder. And... I just, I don't like the fact that instead of going out and farming for your gear... They, and trying, you know, trying to get it from bosses and stuff, instead they just made it to where you could trade in some of your useless gear in a grinder to get the farm for the legendary gear you wanted to. But so basically you're just standing in place, just putting stuff in a grinder over and over trying to get the gear you want, instead of going out and trying to get it. I just felt like it was kind of cheap. And I really didn't like it that much because you, you weren't really putting in too much effort to get this gear. You were just you were just standing there in front of the grinder, putting your stuff in the grinder, not getting what you wanted, and then just dashboarding and then doing it again until you got the thing you wanted. Whether that be the bulwark shield or whatever you were going for that you really wanted, you could just keep doing that with this specific combination of gear that gave you legendaries until you got the thing that you wanted which i did not like i felt like it was a crutch i felt like that was the way to get all your gear in the game and i didn't really like it that much but and that's a little bit of a big thing and that's one of the reasons that my i gave it an eight out of ten instead of like a maybe like a nine uh because i definitely think without the grinder and with the bosses being actually refarmable i think this game would be like a nine out of ten for sure 
But yeah, that's all I have in this video, guys. I know this is a little bit of a long one, but I just wanted to talk about the pre-sequel and why I think this game just gets a bad rap for, like, no reason. This is actually a really good game. And if you guys didn't enjoy it the first time around, I definitely recommend you go out and play it and tell me how you think it is uh, after you play it again. I definitely feel like, uh, definitely when this game very first came out, it wasn't in the best of shape in my opinion. And the bad things definitely overshadowed the good things. But the longer the game went on, this game aged very well and it turned into a very good game. But that's all I have in this video, guys. Feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. And I'll see you guys on the next one.